Okay, so as we start the muscular system, I'm going to do a, just a little review of what we did in muscle physiology. So, you know, the first slide is a review. And if you look at uh, this system, this is a lot easier than muscle physiology, though by now, you know, if you kind of piece together the bits that you learned in muscle physiology, they really start beginning to make sense, okay? So this one's a little easier. Use a lot of your common sense when you answer a lot of these questions. So the first one is like we're looking at the types of muscle fibers. So if you remember skeletal, the way we classified, you know, broadly, it was voluntary and striated. And uh, some of its features, it's seen in the body wall. That means all of your muscles of your limbs on the outer surface of your body. Uh, muscles in the thorax, muscles, um, you know, the lower limb. And then you have this muscle, the diaphragm, which is a thoracic diaphragm. You have another diaphragm called the pelvic diaphragm. So some of these skeletal muscles are present within, inside the body cavity. But most of them are outside in the body wall, like your, you know, muscles of your limbs and the ones in your thorax and abdomen. Okay. Uh, you all saw um, when we were doing muscle physiology, these were long cylindrical structures. They were multinucleate cells. So if you look histologically at a muscle, each muscle is a long cylinder like this. It um, is made up of many nuclei, multinucleate, because if you remember, I said this was because the cells actually fused together. They were initially single small cells. They fused together to make one long cell, so that's why it is multinucleate. The nuclei are just below the sarcolemma, so that is sarcolemma, so they're known as hypolemmal. And this muscle is striated. If you remember, it had those dark and light bands, A and I bands, right? So it is striated. So these are some features. And this is innervated by the, by the somatic nervous system. The somatic nervous system is the voluntary nervous system. So this muscle is voluntary, so it will be innervated by the voluntary nervous system. And in the somatic nervous system, if you remember I, uh, in your muscle physiology, there was a slide which showed you the spinal cord and in the center of the spinal cord is the gray matter and it kind of arises, these nerve fibers arise from this gray matter and they go out and then they go to supply the muscle. Okay, so imagine if this was the muscle. So they arise from there and go to supply the muscle. Cardiac muscle is involuntary but it is striated, seen in the heart and just the beginnings of the blood vessels which arise from the heart. Here the cells are short branching cells that means they branch like this central nucleus and this also shows striations and in between cells if you're lucky you might see what is known as an intercalated disc it's rather difficult to see it under the power that we use in the lab these because they are involuntary they are innervated by the autonomic nervous system and they have a capability of being able to contract on their own. They don't necessarily always need the nervous system there. The nervous system influences it. But if you take the heart outside the body where the nerves are cut, it still is capable of beating for some time. So they have an inherent rhythmicity. Smooth muscle is also involuntary, but this one is non-striated. So there are no striations here. And these are spindle-shaped cells. So they are long spindles. They look like fish swimming in a stream. Very compact. These are seen in walls of hollow organs. All your organs which are hollow, which have a cavity inside, like your stomach, or urinary bladder, any duct in the body, like um, the uh, bile duct or the pancreatic duct, um, other structures, ureter. So all of these organs, uh, small intestine, large intestine, all of these organs, they, they have smooth muscle in their walls. And again, because they're involuntary, these two are innervated by the autonomic nervous system, okay? So here it's showing you what exactly is the autonomic and the somatic. So this is kind of a little preview to the nervous system, which we'll begin when we, um, you know, uh, in a few weeks. So here, the somatic nervous system, it has its headquarters in the brain and spinal cord. And then by means of cranial and spinal nerves, so by means of cranial and spinal nerves, 
these nerve fibers go and they innervate the skeletal muscle. So this somatic nervous system is a voluntary system. It's under your control. And if you think about it, a muscle such as the one in your arm, you can control it. Um, you know, you can decide whether you want to flex or you want to extend. You know, you can do that. Um, the diaphragm, I think one of you asked me, what about the diaphragm? You can, you can actually hold your breath for some time. The reason you cannot control it too long is because if you if it if the body allowed you to control it for so long you would stop breathing and you would die right so when you hold your breath the carbon dioxide levels build up in your blood and that is a very powerful respiratory stimulant so that's why it, it kind of overrides that voluntary control and you know you automatically start breathing okay Autonomic nervous system is made up of two parts which are diametrically opposite. Their actions are opposite to each other. We have a part which is called the parasympathetic system which is an at rest system. And we have a sympathetic system which is um, a system which is an alert system if you want to put it that way. So whenever you have anything that requires you to go on high alert the sympathetic will kick in. And the parasympathetic is what's acting right now when you sit in class and you're just listening. So they have opposite actions, but they both act on smooth muscles and cardiac muscle. So just to give you an example, so for example, in the eye, you have smooth muscles. You have smooth muscles which constrict your eye, so they cause your pupil to get smaller. Okay, they constrict the pupil and you have a smooth muscle which kind of dilates the pupil, makes your pupils get a little larger. The parasympathetic system acts on the muscle which causes constriction. The sympathetic system acts on the muscle which causes dilation. And here's uh, how you're going to remember it. And you don't need to remember it now. You can remember it for nervous system. I'm just giving you an example how all their actions are different. Um, I said sympathetic was on high alert, right? So when you're on high alert, remember, imagine if I said there was a fire in the in the building and you had to run out. Wouldn't you want your pupils to be dilated so that more light could go into your eye and you could see better, you could see all around. You don't want them to be a little chinky at that time and not be able to see much, right? You don't want them to really close off so that you're not able to see much. So that's why the sympathetic will always do something to keep your body in a prepared state for fight, flight or fright. And the parasympathetic is at, at, at rest. So, you know, when you're sitting at rest, you don't need your pupils to be that dilated because you just want... Or the normal amount of light, light going in, okay? Similarly, another example is on the heart, the sympathetic causes your heart rate to increase. Again, whenever you're frightened, your heart rate goes up so that the heart can pump out more blood to go to all the tissues. Parasympathetic slows down your heart because you don't need, to, need it to be really working over time, okay? We'll do more about these when we do the, um, the nervous system, but for now, you remember that these... These are the parts which control uh, the cardiac and smooth and this is an, the autonomic and this is an involuntary system the, because these muscles are involuntary, okay, cardiac and smooth. Now let's look at some skeletal muscle terms. So some of the terms that we need, we use whenever we are talking about skeletal muscle. The first one is or we always talk about muscles are attached to bones and they pull on bones to cause movement. So they, wherever they are attached to bone, there is a part where they are attached where the part does not move and then there is a part where they are attached and that's the part which moves. So just to give you an example, here is the biceps muscle, you all know it, it's called biceps brachii because you have another biceps in the leg, in the lower limb, uh, it's in the present in the thigh. So brachii is for brachium or the arm. So this arises from the scapula. So this up here, so it crosses the shoulder joint, crosses the elbow joint, and this goes and inserts on the radius. Uh, most of its insertion is on the radius, but a little bit of the biceps sort of goes across and inserts on the ulna. But the main insertion is on the radius, okay? So if this part where it's attached proximally is called the origin because this part does not move. This part where it's attached distally is called the insertion because it moves. Because imagine if this muscle were to contract and shorten, what would happen? Which part would move? This, the bone, the, these two bones of the forearm, they would move up this way, right? 
they would move up this way and that's how you cause flexion when you do this you can't bring your scapula down towards your towards your radius and your ulna can you see that it's impossible to do that you can't take the scapula and bring it down when the muscle shortens you can't get this end closer to this end by this end moving down this end can move towards that okay so the movable point is known as the insertion the fixed point is called the origin and you can understand when a muscle contracts the muscle is like a rubber band so imagine at rest it's like a stretched rubber band when it contracts what is it going to do it's going to try to get the two ends close to each other of which one remains fixed the other one moves and it tries to approach the fixed end okay most situations when a muscle is going from a proximal to a distal part most situations the proximal part is the origin and the distal part is the insertion so just to give you another example so imagine if i drew this radius and ulna all the way down and call the radius here and here are the carpal bones and here i have the fingers okay not a very i don't have enough space but imagine if you had a muscle which was arising let's say from the radius and went down all the way to the thumb like this okay you can see that it's the thumb which is going to be able to move and the wrist which is going to be able to move towards the radius you can't bring the radius down towards the thumb right you can't kind of pull your radius down towards the thumb the forearm but you can move the hand and the thumb towards that right so it's the distal attachment which moves so you can understand that's why the proximal attachment here would be the origin and the distal attachment would be the insertion now not all muscles have this kind of an arrangement where they have a proximal to distal not necessarily sometimes you have muscles which may go from a medial to lateral part so um, there's a huge muscle which is present here if this was the chest wall so imagine if this is the sternum and this was the chest wall there's a big muscle which arises from the clavicle the the sternum and the ribs and goes towards the humerus this big muscle is called pectoralis major so you don't need to write the name but i'm just giving an example so it's arising from the sternum the clavicle and the ribs going towards the humerus now which part will move will the humerus move towards the sternum and the clavicle or will the clavicle sternum move towards the humerus the humerus will move right so therefore you can see the medial this would be medial and this would be a lateral attachment so you can see the medial attachment hence becomes the origin and the lateral attachment will become the insertion do you follow so it's the attach you can see you anything which is attached to the axial skeleton and from there goes to the appendicular skeleton most of the time it's the the appendicular one which moves towards the axial right because you cannot take your chest wall and move it towards your uh, uh, towards your humerus sometimes in some muscles you do have situations where both ends will move so it, sometimes it can move from the distal attachment sometimes it can move from the proximal attachment the biceps is not one of them there are certain muscles which are capable of doing that so that's why nowadays sometimes people do away with the word origin and insertion and then just say proximal attachment is this or distal attachment is this medial attachment is this and lateral attachment is this okay another term we use with muscle is that when you look at muscle you can see that the muscle is kind of spindle shaped fusiform and the ends are like little cord like and much thinner the center part is fleshy and towards the ends you have that's where the you have the tendons which attach the muscle to bone so this fleshy central part is often known as the belly of the muscle and it becomes tendinous towards its attachments because you don't want flesh to be attached to bone because flesh is not strong tendons are very strong so imagine if it was the fleshy part which was attached to bone it could tear if there was violent movement whereas tendons are able to withstand stress in a particular direction right so that's why you have tendons attaching the muscle to bone but the central part of the muscle is fleshy and is known as the belly now right here i'm i've been talking about muscles being attached to bones in with the help of tendons most of the muscles in the body are attached to bone 
But there are muscles in your face, the facial muscles. These are inserted into skin. They are not directly attached bone to bone. They are inserted into skin and I seem to remember having mentioned this earlier. And that's why they kind of allow you to have all these uh, facial expressions that you have because of being inserted into the skin. Then tendon, tendon is, as I mentioned, the area where it is attached to bone and the tendon actually passes through and continues as Sharpie's fibers, which we did in skeletal system, where it pins the periosteum to the underlying bone, if you remember that, right? Sharpie's fibers. In certain areas of the body, you will find the tendons, instead of being round like this, they get flattened. When they get flattened, the word we use is aponeurosis. An aponeurosis is a flattened tendon. And here's an example, the biceps, its main attachment is to the radius, but it sends out a little sort of membrane or a flange or a flattened piece, which is called an aponeurosis. So you can see this is flat. This passes out and goes and attaches to the ulna and to the skin. The best place you can see aponeuroses are actually in the abdominal area. So in the anterior abdominal wall, so the anterior abdomen. So this part, your because in the front of your abdo abdomen, the front part, your anterior abdominal wall, there is no bone present there, right? But it's, it's kind of protecting a lot of important organs inside. So if you had all fleshy muscle present here, it would, in, you know, they could tear easily, right? So instead it is replaced, this front of your abdomen, is the muscle is replaced by flat tendinous pieces so that it gives strength to the anterior abdominal wall. And when I, I'll show you a picture, a slide later. So there you find really large aponeuroses and that's how they help the anterior abdominal wall protect the various underlying organs. Let's look at some factors which influence muscle contraction. And again, here's where you would want to use your common sense. So, a large muscle quite obviously would be more powerful than a small muscle, right? It's like having a thick rope compared to a thin rope. A large muscle would have more muscle fibers, which is why it's bulky or large. A small muscle would have fewer muscle fibers, Okay, so it's less bulky. So it won't be as powerful. So the number of muscle fibers determines power. The more the muscle fibers, the bulkier or larger the muscle and hence more powerful. So if you compare, look at this. This is a muscle over here which is present in relation to the scapula. This muscle is called subscapularis. Look at this muscle. So many muscle fibers. Compare it to this muscle over here, the biceps. So this is much larger than this one. So when you take look at the power, this muscle would be more powerful than this one, okay? Let's look at length of a muscle. If you have a muscle which is short, like again, like this muscle here, this one here, or maybe even this one here, and compare that to a muscle which arises from here, this one is not biceps, it's a muscle called coracobrachialis, sorry. If you have a muscle like the biceps which arises from here, comes all the way down and then comes here. So let's look at this muscle, okay? So there's this muscle that I just drew. So I'm going to erase it. So it kind of crosses two joints. So it acts on this joint and it acts on this joint. And then you have this short muscle which is just acting on the elbow joint. This muscle is called brachialis. So of these Shorter muscles have to act only on one joint. So they don't have, they don't need to distribute their power. So it makes them more powerful. Longer muscles tend to, which cross many joints. Whenever a muscle crosses a joint, it will act on it. So if a muscle crosses two joints, it is going to act on those two joints. If a muscle crosses four joints, it will act on all those joints. So the more joints it crosses, the longer the muscle is going to be which means it will have to distribute its power over all of those joints. Hence, it becomes less powerful. But its advantage is it has a greater range of motion or action because it can act on so many joints. So look at this muscle. It only acts on the elbow. 
this muscle the biceps crosses the shoulder so it causes flexion of the shoulder it crosses the elbow so it causes flexion of the elbow so its range of action is on both these joints right you may have a muscle for example you may have a muscle which arises from the humerus crosses the elbow joint crosses the wrist joint and then crosses these joints and goes on to the digit so you can see so many joints it's crossing so it will act on all of those joints okay so short muscles tend to be more powerful because they act on only one joint longer muscles tend to be less powerful but they have a greater range of motion then let's look at the line of pull if a muscle has a straight line of pull so for example if the muscle for here this line of pull is straight like this and here you can see this muscle is kind of turning in this direction this is turning in this direction and let's say there was a muscle which was straight going this way any muscle which has a straight line of pull much easier to act so it will be more powerful when a muscle turns directions like shown up here it loses a little bit of its power because you know it's going to kind of got to veer away from it and at the same time but at the same time what happens is when it changes direction sometimes added range of motion it it uh, it gets a little added range of motion so just as an example this muscle here which is going to the thumb it's changed its direction and is going to the thumb it's lying on the posterior aspect of the uh, of the wrist joint and you'll see that all the muscles which cause extension lie on the posterior aspect this muscle is going to the thumb so because it's crossing going in this oblique fashion it causes extension of the thumb but it also helps to abduct the thumb so it because of that kind of an oblique course if it went just straight across like this it would only be able to cause extension of the thumb so wherever you have muscles which kind of have a little uh, uh, sort of uh, oblique root or they don't have a straight line of pull they are not as powerful but they may have an added range of motion not necessarily but they may have an added range of motion okay now let's look at how we describe muscles based on some actions they perform so for any specific action let's say you were talking about flexion of the elbow joint there's one main muscle which causes flexion that main muscle which causes flexion is known as the prime mover or is also called the agonist okay here it says that the biceps is the prime mover actually there is the muscle which i showed you in the previous this muscle here you can see this one here which is called brachialis so this is really the prime mover of flexion so here flexion at the elbow so we leave it as biceps but remember there's another muscle called brachialis so this is the main muscle which brings about flexion at the elbow joint so this is known as the prime mover or which is known as the agonist and if you observe this picture can you see this is the biceps here and on the opposite side of the joint this is the anterior aspect of the joint this one here is the posterior aspect of the joint on the posterior aspect of the joint is this muscle which is called triceps so when the biceps is acting and the and your forearm is flexed at the elbow joint can you see that the triceps has to stretch in order to allow the biceps to act right and when you want to now from a flex position when you want to straighten or extend the forearm you can understand that the triceps will then act so it's going to perform the exact opposite movement of the biceps can you see that so for any given action the prime mover is called the agonist it's the main muscle which performs the action and any muscle which opposes that action or reverses the movement is known as an antagonist so in flexion of the elbow we will say that the brachialis and here given in this picture biceps is the prime mover and the antagonist is the triceps but let's say that for example you are taking extension of the elbow as your movement then you can understand that triceps is the prime mover and biceps and brachialis would then become the antagonist okay so this 
prime and antagonist depends on which movement you're talking about and the roles can reverse depends on which movement you're saying so you can see at one point it was the antagonist now here it becomes a prime mover because we are talking about an another action most of the time you will find that the prime movers and the antagonists are always located on the opposite sides of a joint so for example if you look at your wrist joint the flexors would be present on the front of the wrist the extensors of the wrist would be present on the posterior aspect of the wrist just as here the flexors are present on the anterior aspect of the elbow the extensors are present on the posterior aspect of the elbow okay so again when you look at the lower limb it will be the same thing so if you look at the hip the flexors will be present at the front of the hip the extensors will be on the posterior aspect of the hip then again for for a specific action so we had prime movers and antagonists here we have two more terms we use one is known as a synergist Sy the word synergy is to help to collaborate so muscles which are helper muscles which aid in the movement or perform the same movement and bring about a more powerful action or they prevent some unnecessary movement by preventing any unnecessary movement they are still helping in the prime main action such muscles are known as synergists so as an example if you look here all of these muscles they are crossing the front of the wrist and later when we do uh, principles of muscle action you can see when they cross in front of the wrist they cause flexion of the wrist the main muscles which cause flexion of the wrist are these two muscles called flexor carpi ulnaris and flexor carpi radialis all these other muscles which cross but they they cross the wrist but they have to go to the digits they also act on the wrist but their main action is on the digits so here what they are is they are acting as synergists to flexor carpi radialis and flexor carpi ulnaris okay because they are performing the same movement in some parts of the body they may act these muscles may not perform a movement they may just stabilize the joint and hence they act as synergists because they pre prevent unnecessary movement uh, one example again is like this these two muscles flexor carpi radialis if you remember from your um, skeletal system if you look at the wrist joint in the wrist you could flex your wrist so if i was to show you the i'm kind of trying to show you the hand and the forearm so this is flexion of the wrist like this when you flex your wrist and the op oops and the opposite movement this way when you you know you straighten your wrist and take it the other way around i know it doesn't look like a wrist but this is extension right this is flexion and this is extension now at the wrist you can do you can flex or bring the wrist towards your forearm or you can take it away which you can extend but remember at the wrist joint you could also do adduction where the where your your hand moved towards the midline so this was adduction and opposite was known as abduction or radial deviation do you remember that you could do flexion extension adduction abduction at the wrist joint so this muscle the flexor carpi ulnaris which is this one it is attached on the medial aspect of the wrist so not because it's crossing the wrist in front not only is it capable of causing flexion it also helps to pull the wrist towards the medial side and this side flexor carpi radialis it flexes the wrist but because it's attached on the lateral side it pulls the wrist laterally so you can you see these muscles they both cause flexion but if only one muscle was acting depending which side it was it would also help to cause adduction or abduction so when they act together not only are they acting as synergists by way of performing the same motion but you can understand but both of them acting together they they cancel out this unnecessary movement of abduction and adduction and only flexion occurs okay so you can see how they are really good synergists at the wrist joint another term we use is fixator where a muscle is it stabilizes a bone let's say a muscle takes origin from a bone and if that bone was allowed to move freely that muscle would not be able to act however if that bone was stabilized then this other muscle can act properly so here's an example this flexor carpi ulnaris is inserted on a little bone here which is a 
which is called the pisiform. This is a carpal bone. You didn't have to know the names of carpal, but just remember it's a carpal bone. And here's this tiny little muscle present here. So here's this flexor carpi ulnaris attached to this pisiform bone. And here's this tiny muscle here, which is acting on the little finger. What it does is it causes your little finger to move away from the midline. So, you know, you all try to do it in class. Move your little finger away from the midline like this. When you take your finger away from the rest, the little finger away from the rest of the fingers. And put your hand on your wrist, just below your wrist. You will find that this tendon becomes taut. Because what happens is, so try and do that. Can you feel this tendon here becoming taut? Yeah. That's because this flexor carpi ulnaris acts like a fixator. What it does is it fixes this pisiform bone here and allows this uh, little muscle, which is called um, abductor, polis uh, abductor digiti, it allows it to carry out this movement. If this was not there, the pisiform would be moving all over the place and the muscle would not be able to act properly. Okay, So such a muscle is known as a fixator. As I said, roles can change for any action. So, you know, a prime mover for one can become an antagonist for another. Okay. It can become a synergist for another movement. Now, at this point, I want to introduce this term. You know, muscles tend, I talked about muscles being fleshy and the ends being tendinous. Muscles can get damaged quite easily because, you know, flesh, they're very vascular. So, they often um, get injured. You can have a contusion. They could be bleeding. The best treatment for uh, muscle injury is what is known as RICE treatment, where R stands for rest. So you always want to rest that muscle. You don't want to kind of stimulate and uh, cause it to contract. So you must take rest if the muscle is injured. I stands for icing. So you ice it, ice that area to bring down the swelling. What ice does, it causes vasoconstriction. So no fluid seeps out. C stands for compression. So you compress that area and keep it tight and compact so you prevent movement. And E stands for elevation. E stands for elevation. So you keep it elevated so it reduces the swelling. Usually whenever there's muscle injury, there tends to be a bit of swelling there because blood vessels have ruptured, blood leaks into the area. You might have what is called a hematoma. So you want to reduce the swelling so you elevate that area. Okay, so this is known as the rice treatment. What, when a muscle is pulled, it's just stretched a little bit. There might be little tearing in it. And again, you want to rest and do all of these same things. Yes. Let's now see how we give muscles their names. So we use a, a variety of uh, ways to describe muscles. And I'm not, I don't have all, I can't put in all the names, but you know, I'll ask you questions on that and you should, you should be able to identify based on a name or based on an action where you would expect to see a muscle. Uh, this would be a good time to review the, uh, in your introduction lecture, there was a slide on surface anatomy. So this might be a good time to kind of view that, um, that page, particularly because the certain parts of the body have different names, like your thumb is called the pollux, your uh, big toe is called hallux, your um, uh, car, uh, wrist is called the carpus, for example, your uh, chest area, the front of your chest is known as pectoral, uh, you know, your back, the buttock area is called gluteal. So this might be a good place to uh, look at that, okay? So let's see muscle names based on origin. So you've done the skeletal system. So remember where your temporal bone was? So this part of the of your skull. So a muscle which is arising from the temporal bone is called temporalis. You have a muscle which arises from the frontal bone, which is called frontalis. There's another muscle arising from the occipital bone at the back here. It's called occipitalis. Actually, this frontalis and occipitalis are fused uh, by an aponeurosis, so they are called occipitofrontalis, okay? Um, and that, muscles which have to do with the tongue. The word for the tongue is glossus. Anything to do with the tongue, we use the word glossus. So, for example, the nerve which supplies the muscles of the tongue is called hypoglossal. 
uh, when your tongue is inflamed, that condition is called glossitis. Okay, so the word glossus is to do with tongue. So you can see here, genioglossus, because it arises from little tubercles on the mandible called genio, gen, uh, genial tubercles. So genioglossus, styloglossus. Remember in the skull, there was a little process here called styloid process. This this little process here called the styloid process. So styloglossus goes from the styloid process to the tongue. Hyoglossus from the hyoid bone to the tongue. So hyoglossus, you see the word glossus everywhere, okay? Um, you, you have other uh, palatoglossus. There's a muscle called palatoglossus from the palate to the tongue. So you see the word glossus. So the tongue has lots of different connected points. Oh, there are lots of muscles which go to the tongue, yes. Then muscles which lie between the ribs are called intercostal because between cost, the word costal is for ribs, so intercostal. So here the muscles lie in different planes. Some muscles are present outside, some are present a little bit more internally and some are present even more internal. So you can go superficial to deep. So that's why these muscles are called external intercostal. Deep to it is internal intercostal and actually even deeper is something called innermost intercostal. So can you see location, intercostal and also external because it's on the outside or internal because it's more on the inside. Then we have muscles called, I use the word superficial and deep. So here you can use either external or internal or you can use the word profundus or superficialis. The word profundus comes from the word profound. And in English, we use the profound. Oh, this has a profound meaning, meaning it has a very deep-seated meaning, something very deep, okay? So the word profundus means that muscle is deep. And superficialis, as the name suggests, is the muscle is superficial. So here, if you look at this name, flexor digitorum profundus. Just by the name, you can say flexor. That means it's a flexor. Digitorum, it's going to the digits. We don't know which digits. It could be the toes or the fingers. And profundus, it lies deep. Okay? This is flexor digitorum superficialis. So again, a flexor of the digits, but it's lying a little bit superficially. So these two muscles are together. This is superficial, this is deep. It just so happens that these muscles belong to the, they go to the hand. Okay? Some more names based on location. So if it is in the gluteal region, you will find the muscles will have the word gluteus attached to it. So for example, here gluteus maximus means maximus means really large. There are muscles called gluteus medius and minimus too. Abdominus, when the word abdominus is used, then you know that the muscle is lying in the abdomen. So here you have this muscle here is called external oblique. The true name is actually external obliquus abdominus. So it tells you it's in the abdomen. This muscle here is called rectus abdominus. And here is the aponeurosis I was talking about. So you can see that this muscle is fleshy till here. And beyond that, this area is all aponeurotic because you need this area to be really, really strong since there's no bone over there, okay? So you have external oblique, there's an internal oblique, and there's a transversus. So again, you can see that, and they're called external obliquus abdominus, internal obliquus abdominus, so that tells you that they're in the abdomen. Then we have muscles, um, you know, in the previous one, I showed you a picture of um, um, Flexor carpi ulnaris. Remember, I, I use the word flexor carpi ulnaris. So you, here you can see the word carpus means to do with the wrist. Ulnaris, it's lying on the ulnar side, right? Lying on the ulnar side. Or it was flexor carpi radialis. So again, it's a, a muscle which is flexing the wrist but lying on the radial side, close to the radius. So similarly, in the lower limb, we use the word tibialis and fibularis. So, you know, because the tibia is the medial bone, so any muscle to, related to the tibia would be medial. Any muscle related to the fibula would be lateral, okay? So you, you might have a muscle called fibularis longus. You might have a muscle called fibularis brevis. You might have a muscle called tibialis anterior. 
which means anterior and posterior means which side they are lying on which part are they anteriorly placed or are they posteriorly placed okay that makes sense and tibialis anterior or tibialis posterior so here you can see radialis this side would be ulnaris carpus means wrist some others that you might have some other areas of the body are uh, for example anything to do with the front of the chest wall would be pectoral um anything to no, do with the knee the knee is often called the genu so you might have the word genu uh, attached to it uh, the back of the thigh is called ham so that's why you call these hamstrings because this back of the thigh area is called ham and these muscles looked like look like their tendons look like little strings so butchers used to kind of hang them up by a hook so you know they were very stringy and you know like that that's how these muscles got the name hamstrings okay so you can see this area is called ham so that's how you you get these names so here look at this question a muscle named tibialis posterior where would you expect to find this muscle so here's where you got to use common sense and also use your skeletal system knowledge some more people okay very good most of you got this right yes it is not going to be found on the anterior and medial aspect of the leg look at the word posterior tibialis posterior that means on the posterior part of the tibia which is the calf area right the back of the leg so it's a posterior and medial aspect of leg remember your leg is from the knee downwards so this is this muscle would therefore be seen in the calf isn't it because that's the posterior aspect tibialis anterior would be seen on the front and medial part of your leg so your front of your leg okay it won't be the thigh because remember the tibia is in a leg bone the femur is the thigh bone so if you had a muscle we don't have it but if you have a muscle called femoris posterior then that would be seen in the posterior aspect of the thigh okay Let's look at muscles now based on shape na their names So here are some the word orbicularis means circular like an orbit that's how we got the word orbicularis orbit like and orbit remember goes round like that okay so orbicularis based on where it is present we call this orbicularis oculi which means it has to do with the eye orbicularis oris to do with the mouth most of these orbicularis muscles are present around orifices like the eye the opening of the eye the opening of the mouth so you can understand when this muscle contracts what is it going to do it's going to be able to close that opening okay or make it smaller so in fact the orbicularis oculi is a muscle that helps you to shut your eyes you know close your eyes like that because when th this muscle contracts it closes the eye the orbicularis oris helps to purse your lips it actually is called the kissing muscle though your kisser because again it makes your lip or uh, you know your lips kind of get puckered up like that so that's what the orbicularis oris does then um, if a muscle is triangular we call it a uh, deltoid like this from the letter delta this muscle here is the deltoid and this muscle actually arises from the scapula and the clavicle so it comes down on either side and it goes on the other side too so this looks somewhat triangular so if you look on like this and on the front and this way so it's triangular so that's why this is called deltoid any muscle which is square um i don't have a picture here but we i'll show it to you when we get to the slide there's a muscle in your forearm which is called pronator quadratus So the word quadrate, 
quadrate means four sided okay quadrangular four sided so that's how you get the nerve name quadratus we have this muscle called the trapezius this is actually two muscles so there are two muscles another one on this side which has been removed so this is the muscle on of the right side and this is the one shown of the left side so by itself each trapezius actually is a triangular muscle can you see this muscle by itself is triangular right but when the two muscles are put together so when both right and left trapezius are put together can you see you get a four sided figure which looks like a trapezium you should go back and read your geometry and see what a trapezium what are, what is the definition of a trapezium okay so this looks like a trapezium so that's why this muscle is called trapezius now this you must understand that the muscle by itself is actually triangular but it's only when both muscles are put together that the both together look like a trapezium and that's how they got their name trapezius the word teres means a round belly so most muscles have them but this one this muscle here called teres major happens to have a particularly rounded belly so this is called teres you have another muscle which you will see later called pronator teres so whenever you have that muscle pronator teres that tells you this muscle is capable of pronation and has a rounded belly okay rhomboid rhombus is also a four sided figure where two sides are parallel and longer than the other two sides so this is this muscle is called rhomboid there's this one also is called rhomboid so again this one too is four sided so this you can see again based on shape then we have a muscle which which we'll see again in later pictures which is serrated that means it's when you look at the muscle from the side the muscle looks like it has you know like a knife it has the the edge of a knife if you look at a knife which is serrated like this right so this muscle has these serrations which are present so this muscle is present on the anterior aspect of the chest wall so it's known as serratus anterior so the the muscle fibers are arranged their origin is arranged like teeth in a comb so it's called serratus okay so if it's present on the anterior aspect we call it serratus anterior if it's present on the posterior aspect we call it serratus posterior okay so let's stop here